countries, people ask lots of questions. Sometimes uh, they don't, but uh, I think it's better to get questions from the students and sure, uh, sure. whatever they are interested in. Yeah, yeah. We uh, later uh, the student. A uh, moderator from students. So by the end of your session, there will be a question and answer session. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. So I think it's very interesting a topic. So how many years you spend in Japan? Well, uh, I, I spent seven years in Japan. Uh, oh. I did my PhD in Kyoto University, oh. mm -hmm. and uh, I also spent. Uh, one year uh, later on in Kobe University as well as a researcher. Mm -hmm. This was actually a few months before the COVID started. So when the COVID mm -hmm. pandemic started, I was in Japan. We can oh, talk yeah. about that as well, if you'd like, I don't know. <laughs> and um, it, it kind of, of course, had a bad impact on my research, unfortunately, oh, but mm -hmm. uh, well, these things, you know, everybody's influenced this way or another. Yeah, everybody affected the book. This COVID pandemic. Oke, okay, um, Mbak MC hari ini sudah siap. Uh, siapakah habisinya? Shakira ya, kalau nggak salah. Iya, yeah, yeah, yeah. sudah. Oke, okay, Shakira. Oke, Uh, uh, you will share your own slide, or uh, we help. Oh, but you can. Oh, you already co-host. Co yeah, you already co-host, and you can share uh, your slide. Sure. Uh, Pak Wadli, kita mulai sekarang atau uh, menunggu? Ya, yeah, Bu. Silakan dimulai aja, Bu. Yeah. Oh, Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, Mbak Shakira. Uh, we, uh, uh, Mr. Bahadir, we will start now. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Sure. okay, Mbak Shakira, silahkan take over. Baik, Bu. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings, scholars. Dear Honorable Mrs. Asma Lutfi, STHI M. Hum, as the head of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Dear Honorable Dr. Bahadir Pahlivantuk, Associate Professor as our presenter, Dear Honorable all the lecturers who have taken the time to attend today's conservation education class and all our fellow students who are present in today's class. First of all, please let me introduce myself. My name is Shakira Desmalia Rizma, the Master of Ceremony for today's class. Praise and gratitude for the presence of God Almighty who has bestowed His grace and guidance to all of us. Salawat and salam we pour out to our Prophet Muhammad wasallam, who has brought us to the age of enlightenment. Ladies and gentlemen, on this occasion, I would like to read the agenda for today's conservation education course. First is the opening. Second is the senior reading. Third presentation material by Professor Bahadir Pahlivantar. Next is the Q&A session. And finally, our agenda will be completed with a closing. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, we will enter the next session by introducing our speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so sorry for the distraction um, of the noise. We will start. In 2004, Dr. Bahadir Fahri Van Turk graduated with a doctorate in philosophy at Kyoto University. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry for the distraction. There was um, an attraction there, my location, and it has passed by, and I will continue to our occasion. All right, in 2004, Dr. Bahadur Fahriventer graduated with a doctorate in philosophy at Kyoto University and International Relations. He is currently working as an associate professor at COBB University of Economics and Technology and current Department of Political Science and International Relations. He was an awardee of Kyoto University Honors Fellowship twice in 2002 and 2003. He has successfully published a journal in 2019 with the title, The Effects of National Law Conception on Bilateral Relations, Japan-Turkey, Relationship in Quest of Identity in Asia-Pacific Review 26, number two. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is the schedule for today's course. Now, together with our speaker, we will enter the core of event by discussing and learning. For the presentation of material by Professor Bahadur, this time our discussion is raised with the theme of international relations and economics. So without further ado, I would like to welcome our speaker to deliver the presentation to Professor Bahadur. The chance is yours. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to your uh, lecture. I am very happy to speak to Indonesian students. Assalamu uh, alaikum to you all. And happy past holidays, uh, eight holiday, uh, which was a week ago. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. As uh, I'm introduced, uh, I, uh, my uh, specialty is political science and international relations. And um, I focus on Japanese foreign policy. And uh, during my research two years ago, I was researching about the Turkey-Japan aid relations and Japanese uh, aid policy. So I prepared a presentation which focuses on uh, Japan's uh, ODA policy and humanitarian aid and its aid philosophy and its position in Japanese security. Um, and, uh, but before that, I would be talking about uh, the start of Japan-Turkey relations. And uh, as a matter of fact, how, how come the aid is such an important topic in bilateral relations between the two countries? So even though title of the presentation says Turkey's relations with Asia in general, I focus on Turkey-Japan relations and further focus on aid relations in it. But I will be happy to answer questions uh, that might be coming from you about Turkey's relations with the other parts of Asia and some other related topics as well. So let me share my slides. I will be, uh, uh, just a second. Yes. Uh, I think I'm able to share this now. Uh, yes, I hope you can see it. Yes, uh, just let me grab my uh, notes as well. So for the interruption, I also, you know, uh, use two two computers, <laughs> one to, you know, presentation. So I'm going to talk about how actually identity uh, is actually used and shapes, in a sense, constructs uh, the basic nature of Turkey-Japan relations. And this identity is very much related with aid, which uh, mutual aid, let me say, which started very early in Turkey-Japan relations. And in modern times, this is continuing with what we call the triangular cooperation and South-South cooperation in aid relations, which might be related with Indonesia as well. 
Now, the early Turkey-Japan relations actually is quite uh, old, uh, not as old as, of course, Japan's relations with Indonesia, but old nevertheless. Uh, as you know, Japan opens up at the middle of the 19th century to the rest of the world. And um, towards the end of the century, uh, in 1890, uh, the Ottomans uh, are now following a pan-Islamist policy in the world. And uh, they wanted to uh, establish connection with the Muslims in Asia. Uh, as uh, you probably know, at that time, the Ottoman Empire, Empire was also the Caliph, and at least nominally, he was supposed to be the head of uh, the Muslims in the world. And the uh, Ottoman Empire at that time was in fierce struggle with the Western powers uh, in terms of influence in the world. And there was a competition with the British Empire at that time. And uh, Britain was worried about uh, Ottoman uh, Empire, the Padishah as we call it, to use his position as the caliph to incite revolt among the Muslims around the world. Interestingly, at the end of the 19th century, most of the Muslims in the world were under the British Empire, okay? So there was some uh, negative propaganda against the caliph, and as a part of this global struggle, okay, Ottomans uh, decided to uh, start a PR policy, okay? Uh, they wanted to commission this frigate, this ship, which is called Arturul, okay, the Arturul frigate, to make a visit to Japan. Uh, why Japan? Uh, well, there are two reasons for this. For one thing, uh, by the end of the 19th century, uh, Japan was already quite conspicuous in its successes in modernization. Uh, just a second, uh, my voice is coming clear to you, right? And uh, there is nothing wrong with the presentation, right? You can see it on your screens. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, uh, there was some visit from the Japanese beforehand, okay? And the Japanese emperor presented, sent some presents to Ottoman emperor and they wanted to return, you know, as a courtesy, the diplomatic courtesy to return this visit. But the Ottoman empire, Abdul Hamid II, okay? at that time was very much interested in Japanese modernization and the successes that the Japan was having uh, already by the end of the 19th century. Uh, there's also a strategic reason. Uh, Ottomans were at that time also in a fierce and very difficult struggle against the Tsarist Russia. So the Russian empire was putting lots of pressure. Uh, there is a long hold Russian policy of getting into the Southern seas, okay, the warm seas. You know, Russia has been blocked by ice from both Vladivostok, the Far East, and also the Baltic Sea. So they didn't have access to the warm seas. So there were lots of wars going on between Ottomans and the Russians. And similarly, Japan was also in a competition of influence over the Korean Peninsula with Russians, which was going to end up in the uh, very famous, well-known uh, Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905. So they were actually trying to find a way to connect the Japanese from the two sides of the Eurasian continent, two sides of Russia empire, that maybe they could have some strategic cooperation with each other. So this ship was sent. Now the part about Asia here is that um, they have actually uh, wanted this ship, the Arturo Frigate, to visit lots of ports in Asia, some important ports, and especially the places where Muslims were living, starting from India, going through Southeast Asia to Japan. This Arturul Frigate uh, stopped by in various uh, cities, and uh, they also made some uh, connects, connections with the Muslim populations, okay, which were under different European empires. So as a part of this, um, this became actually a huge PR uh, public relations experiment and a quite success. Uh, some Muslim uh, Friday prayers were held, Juma prayers were held on this ship. And because the ship uh, hoisted the flag of the Caliph, it was regarded as the free land 
probably you know the the, the Friday prayers are as a farz, is an obligation to only free Muslims. Okay, so people flock to the ship and they held Muslim prayers, uh, Friday prayers together on the ship. Uh, this irked the uh, British Empire quite a lot, uh, but nevertheless, it seems to be a success. However, <coughs> the Ottoman Empire was this time was actually quite weak, and the ship was actually not suitable for a long voyage to open seas. Okay, the soldiers on the ship these are actually cadets, students. Okay, the uh, maritime navy students. Okay, and uh, the reason they actually Yes. Is there a question? Nothing. Okay. Uh, these, uh, uh, the reason they took a, a training ship was actually not to anger the British Empire too much or the Russians. Okay. It looked as a diplomatic visit rather than a military visit. So this ship goes all the way uh, with lots of troubles. Okay. Up to the uh, uh, let me say, uh, uh, Japan, okay, and they stop in Japan, uh, and they spend a couple of months in Tokyo, they give presents to the Japanese Meiji Emperor from the Abdel Hamid II, and then they start their return journey. Uh, around the uh, Pacific, okay, across uh, which is now the Japanese city of Wakayama, in a town near, which is called Kushimoto, there is a typhoon, and the ship uh, wrecks in the typhoon. It sinks, okay? And uh, approximately uh, 700 cadets, uh, 600 cadets, uh, sadly die here, okay? Uh, and they were rescued by the people of Japan, or people of Wakayama. Uh, and of course, uh, the people who are rescued were there were about approximately 30 people will survive from this disaster, okay? And of course, uh, the Japanese people helped them and uh, by uh, commissioning of two ships by the Meiji Emperor, they are sent back to Turkey. And uh, back in Turkey, uh, these uh, cadets, okay, the survivors speak very well of Japan, okay? And they uh, start a very positive image, okay, of Japan in Turkey which coincides with the time when there is actually now Japan, we are now in 1920s and 30s, uh, Japan has become an imperialist power and it starts a pan-Asian policy. And uh, <clears throat> reaching out to Islamic lands becomes very important for them. So they send some people to uh, Ottoman Empire <clears throat> and they investigate uh, Islam and Ottoman Empire and they write some very positive books. Now, these are not in the slides, these are in a different slide, actually. I was not planning to go into Turkey, Asia, and Japan, Islamic world relations uh, at this time, but I'd better talk about this. <clears throat> Up until actually 1920s, the Japanese writings about Islam are uh, quite bad, okay? There are like seven or eight documents that Japanese came to the Islamic world, they investigated, and they wrote about. But um, some important Japanese, the most important is uh, Yamada Torajiro, which is in my other slide. I can show you after this presentation ends. He goes to Japan, becomes like something, he goes to Istanbul and becomes something like a honorary ambassador there, okay? And he writes books about very positive image uh, reflecting Islam to the Japanese, which I believe created a positive image of Islam in the Japanese empire as well. Now, the story of this shipwreck, Ertuğrul Frigate, is now the basis or the symbol, let me say, of the Turkish-Japanese diplomatic relations. Even though contacts between the two sides, Japan's and the Turks, started earlier than the frigate, uh, this uh, trip by the frigate, uh, this is accepted as the official start of relations between Turkey and Japan, okay, uh, 1890. Um, so, um, Later on, actually, this is used a lot. Uh, it's made into a film, okay? Uh, it's half in Turkish, half in Japanese, of course, okay? And uh, 
this is also became a part of Turkish Japanese relations. Now, years later, okay, in 1980s, I'm going to make a huge jump here just to explain you how mutual aid became a basis of Japanese Turkish relations. There was another incident. This was the time of Iran Iraq war, okay? And Iran Iraq war also had a, a missile phase, okay? Iraqis and the Iranians started to uh, throw missiles to each other's capitals. And Saddam Hussein, the Iraqi leader at that time, made a warning that Tehran is going to be bombed by missiles, okay? And the Japanese who were living in Tehran wanted to escape, but there were no airplanes, okay? Uh, they, they were stra uh, stranded in Tehran. So what Turkey does is that Turkey uh, sends the Turkish airlines to Tehran and they evacuate the Japanese citizens from harm. And this becomes a huge issue in Japan as well, okay? Uh, these are some uh, newspaper clippings about this. This is in Turkish, the last flight from Tehran. This is Japanese, okay? Uh, Torko Kode, uh, 250 people saved by the Turkish airlines, okay? And this incident is, as, uh, is actually uh, is covered in this movie as well, at the end of the movie, okay? Some Turkish um, uh, citizens uh, gave their seats in the airplane to the Japanese families, seeing that how worried the Japanese were. And they were saying that about 100 years ago, Japanese were, were very kind to Turkish shipwreck survivors of Artur Trugit, and they should return the favor to them. Okay, they said, and they gave seats to them. So this actually, uh, there is a professor, Selçuk Esenber, who writes extensively about the Islamic world and the Japan relations, okay? She has very good uh, papers and books about it. Uh, she calls it a bit of a romantism, okay? There is a romantism in Turkish-Japanese relations using the narrative of this mutual rescue. However, this had actually give a color, okay, the Turkish-Japanese relations. Uh, let me give you another uh, picture. Now, like Indonesia, okay, sadly so, Turkey, and as like Japan, is an earthquake-prone country. We have lots of earthquakes and lots of earthquake disasters. Maybe luckily so, uh, Mediterranean is not as big as the ocean. We don't have tsunamis, but the earthquakes are there occasionally. There, every decade, there's one big earthquake, okay? So here, um, uh, there was an earthquake in 2011, and uh, at this time, um, Turkey sent aid to Japan, okay? And they sent a rescue team. Uh, there's an institution called AFAT, which are quite, uh, which have developed their uh, rescue, search and rescue efforts quite well. Uh, they went to Japan and they functioned in Japan longer than any other country. They stayed in Japan to save the people uh, who were under the tsunami rubbles, okay? But while the Turkey was aiding Japan, uh, there was another earthquake in Turkey, in Eastern Turkey, in Van, okay? And uh, in this earthquake, the Japanese started to help Turkey. So there was an interesting situation. Aid workers working in both countries cross, okay? And in one earthquake, in an aftershock, one of the volunteers, okay, uh, Mr. Miyazaki, uh, was uh, under the rubbles and he passed away, he died, okay? And he kind of became a hero in Turkey. And his uh, body was sent with a military funeral, official funeral, and they named a the school after his name, okay? Uh, maybe you can let's see, but Atsushi Miyazaki uh, Middle School, it is called, and there's a statue of him, okay, at the middle of the school. So these stories of mutual help, mutual aid is actually pretty much utilized by the diplomats of the both country. Any speech about Turkey and Japan starts with the Artur Frigate, and they talk about the Tehran rescue, and then the earthquake aid and stuff like that. Okay, this is how uh, Turkish-Japan friendly identity is constructed. Now, most of the students are from other disciplines. I study political science and international relations. So there is this uh, IR uh, theory or uh, conceptual framework called social constructivism which is a part of social sciences in general as well. So in a sense, they, uh, both countries and the both people develop their identities on these historical narratives, okay? 
any comments, any questions up until now? I would like to stop so now and then because I'm worried that I might be losing the audience sometimes. Okay, there doesn't seem to be any hand rising up for that. Now, uh, the Turkey-Japan aid relations is actually older than these. I mean, okay, uh, Atul Frigate is the oldest. But I would like to talk about uh, the Turkish War of Independence, okay, after the end of the war. World War I, the Ottoman Empire loses the war and it disintegrates. And uh, the Western powers also want to colonize Turkey as well. And there was the resistance war in Turkey, okay, which lasted from uh, 1990 to 1923, okay. And at this time, uh, Japan was actually at the other side, okay. Japan in First World Wars was allied with France and Britain, okay. But there was no fight between Japan and Turkey. And during the independence war was going on, uh, the Japanese were actually very much interested in it. And they were actually very much inspired by this war that Atatürk, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk was leading. And there were even some uh, poems about this. And uh, uh, it's not very well known even in Turkey, but actually Japan was, uh, had good relations with the Ankara government, and there was also an Istanbul government at that time. Ottoman Empire was still continuing, but there was this rebellious government in Ankara as well. And they made an intermediary between the British and the Turks, okay? And uh, interestingly, actually, it seems that British already knew that they were going to lose the war, but they couldn't do anything about it. But nevertheless, the war was ended, and Ataturk's uh, government, Ankara government, was victorious in it, and the modern Turkey as a republic was established, okay? Now, the Japanese were seemed to be quite excited about this, okay? And um, uh, they wanted to make contacts with the modern Turkish Republic. Uh, the reason is uh, Japan also has a kind of a unique situation, if you look at it at that era in the world, okay? It is not a Western country, but it's independent. It got rid of the unequal treaties that was imposed on it by the Western powers by 2000, I'm sorry, uh, 1904, 1905 after the Russo-Japanese War. And after this war of independence, Turkey also emerged as a free and independent country. Uh, and also it's got rid of the, uh, semi-colonial status, it got rid of the unequal treaties itself as well. And the Japanese actually were interested in Turkey as a non-Western country, but an independent country, which is a part of the world system, okay? And they come to Turkey, and what they found is that they found a very poor Turkey, actually, okay? After uh, maybe, I don't know how you know about that part of Ottoman history, but Ottomans were in continuous warfare for the last 30 years, okay? And the war of independence was also very destructive. So actually they start their aid relations then. By 1920s, Japan is already a big power, okay? And it's already industrialized. And this is uh, the picture of uh, uh, called Otani Kozui. This man is actually um, a relative of the Japanese imperial family, but he's also a philanthropist, okay? He likes helping and they have this idea of uh, developing, rising up uh, the developing world. Some of them, many of them were actually under colonies, but Turkey was not, through agricultural development, okay? So they wanted to invest into agriculture. And this is actually the first uh, foreign direct investment uh, to the modern Republic of Turkey, okay? After it was established. They uh, gave um, investment for uh, Gazi farm project, which is in Ankara. It's quite famous, actually. It also has some strategic aspects as well. You know? This was not only about altruism, it's not only about philanthropy. Now, Japanese had this pan-Asianism, actually, at that time. What British were worried about the Caliph, the Abdul Hamid II, Japanese were trying to do it, okay? They wanted to stir up, okay, uh, the Muslims around the world, uh, against the European empires. And since uh, Turkey was the, at least the location of the Ottoman Empire, they came as a part of, you know, this Pan-Asianism. But this time, Turkey is a secular country, okay? It's not interested in Pan-Islamism anymore. But nevertheless, they come, okay? 
And another is actually the opium and cotton cultivation. Uh, when I talk about this, the students uh, kind of love uh, the opium you know, production. Uh, well, you should take your opium as a drug, okay? In the older times, um, operations, okay, had to be done. There's no anesthesia, so they had to use opium, morphine, okay? So this is actually a military strategy. Both opium and cotton are related with military. In war, in the field hospitals, you have to make operations, you have to sedate the soldiers using opium, and all the uniforms are made by cotton. So they actually wanted to look, search for possibility of opium and cotton cultivation to be exported to Japan. Anyway. So starting from these, this narrations of mutual aid and rescue, okay, became a part of, uh, which solidified the friendly nature of relations with uh, Turkey and Japan. And uh, this continued, okay, later on in many different ways. Generally earthquakes, but more than that, I will talk about it. Um, Japan became one of the important aid donors in the world. It gave quite a lot of aid to Turkey as it gave to Indonesia. Indonesia, as I know, is one of the focus of Japanese aid as well, okay? So, now the official development assistance to Turkey, okay, starts um, in 1959, in 1958, Japan signs the uh, Colombo plan, okay? It becomes a aid donor, okay? And uh, more than 60 years, Japan has been giving development aid to Turkey, okay? Over, uh, according to Japanese government's documents, okay? 750 billion yen cumulated, okay? In total was given to Turkey, okay? And uh, as a part of JETRO programs, uh, JICA, uh, JETRO programs, uh, JICA programs, I, I, I'm sorry, about 400 Turkish government pers personnel participate in training programs in Japan. I know a lot of people are going from Indonesia to Japan as well. Now, this aid increased in the Cold War. Now, um, I think you already know some a little bit about, at least a little bit about the Japanese foreign policy. Just in short, the Cold War Japanese foreign policy is actually defined by, by what we call the Yoshida Doctrine, okay? Now, after the ruins of Second World War, the trauma of the Second World War, Japan follows a rather pacifist and passive foreign policy. So it focuses on economic development and uh, the uh, defense of Japan was given as a responsibility to the United States. So Japan becomes very much dependent on the United States in its defense. But as Japan becomes, you know, recovers from the Second World War and slowly becomes a big economic power in the 1980s, becomes an economic superpower, okay? Uh, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, there's a pressure from the United States to do more about, you know, the world uh, politics. And since Japanese constitution, doesn't allow Japan to send uh, military personnel abroad, okay? They decided to complement US geopolitical strategy by giving aid to countries which are deemed important by United States. This is called the Fukuda Doctrine. So these strategically important countries, it started with Pakistan, Turkey, and Egypt, and also Indonesia, okay? Were given, started to be given, some quite large amounts of development aid, okay? So Turkey, Turkey becomes one of the major uh, aid uh, recipient country in Japanese aid policy. Now by 1980s and 90s, Japan is already now accepted as a uh, great power and Turkey starts to become more interested in Japan. Um, let me um, give you another slide. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I thought it was already open here. Um, uh, uh, can you see my screen? Yes, That's we fair. can see your screen. Uh, okay, yes. There you go. Uh, at that time, there is a 
prime minister in Turkey who's called Turgut Özal. It is 1980s, okay? Can you see the screen? The pictures, uh, are there pictures on the screen? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay, the this picture is picture not, uh, Can you see this? This only the it's PowerPoint. Okay, let me uh, share again. Uh, okay. Now this is Turkish, uh, some magazines, okay? Uh, this is the caricature, I hope you can see it on your screen, of Turgut Özal. You know, 1980s, Japan becomes an economic superpower and Americans are very much worried about Japan. People who are in my age would remember that. Uh, you might not know it, but uh, like China today, everybody at that time seemed to think that Japan was going to be the next hegemon and United States was very worried about Japan. And this is the time when the, some serious Japanese investments start in Turkey. So Toyota starts a company, some other Japanese companies also started to come. These investments are still continuing. I'm sure there is much more, of course, Japanese investment in Indonesia, but Turkey became a Japanese um, investment target country at this time. And uh, also the Japanese development model became quite popular, okay? And the Turkish prime minister, Turgut Özal was very much interested in it. And he actually started to promote relations with Japan as well. Let me go back to my other slide. Uh, okay. Uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, so, um, uh, Japanese aid to Turkey continue also at this time, but when we come to 2000, okay, much recent, uh, Turkish economy uh, grows quite well, okay? Uh, even though it's not really going very well in the last few years, uh, 2000, the early, the first decade of the 2000 until 2015, were actually when the economy boomed in Turkey, and its per capita income also increased a lot. And uh, maybe people who are studying the Japanese aid policy would know this. There is this concept of graduation, totsugyo, okay? Now that the Turkey has become an upper income, uh, upper middle income uh, country, that Japan uh, started to change its aid policy to Turkey. First of all, the uh, humanitarian aid, okay? There are two types of aid. One is grant aid and the other is credits, okay? Now, grant aid is, is given as a money which they don't ask it back, okay? They just give that money. Now, the credit is that you're supposed to pay it back. It is still called aid because generally these credits are quite positive, easy to pay, long-term credits with very low interest rates, okay? Uh, but grant aid is you don't even have to pay it back. So uh, the grant aid to Turkey actually started to reduce a lot. And actually since 2011, Japan is not giving grant aid to Turkey anymore, okay? The, all the grant aid given actually uh, is given, um, sorry, it, it's since 2016, but this is given uh, for helping the Syrian refugees in Turkey. I'm going to talk about this actually a little bit, uh, a bit later, uh, about 4 million Syrian refugees came to Turkey running away from the civil war, okay? It became the biggest recipient of uh, refugees in the world because we have a very long border with Syria, okay? The loan aid is still continuing, but the structure also started to change as well, okay? Now, most of the aid is given for disaster damage reduction, okay? Or disaster mitigation, as they say, okay? And there was a joint declaration of a partnership of a strategic partnership between Japan and Turkey. So the diplomatic relations became more regular, okay? And yes, uh, 2015 is the last time loan aid is dispatched, okay? And this was to aid the Syrian refugees. Just an over, okay? I'm not going to go into detail with this, but if you look at uh, uh, activities in Turkey, the uh, projects sponsored by Japan, uh, these are mostly in infrastructure. And this Bosphorus rail tube has been the biggest uh, uh, loan, okay, a credit aid, ODA, 
given in Japanese ODA history. I think it was about more than a billion, okay? And there was this underground, it's given for underground uh, tunnel crossing across the Bosporus, joining Asia and European continents in Istanbul, okay? Uh, some are also given for urban development as well, okay? This is this tunnel project, this is this the biggest. Some is for fishes, some for the water supply projects, okay, for the big cities in Turkey, and some for the schools they were given, okay? Nowadays, uh, the ODA policy of Japan is more for supporting Turkish-Japanese trade, okay? Supporting the Syrian refugees in Turkey, okay? And the continuation of some old projects is continued. Now, a part of this, which might be interesting for uh, Indonesia as well, is uh, called uh, the South-South Cooperation and Triangular Cooperation. Now, what is this, okay? Uh, now, uh, since Turkey is rising up uh, in the development ladder, okay, uh, it's also become an aid donor country. So Turkey is one of the few countries in the world which is receiving aid and giving aid at the same time. In the, uh, uh, China, Brazil are also countries like this, okay? Now, uh, in the past, most of the aid was given uh, through uh, uh, major developed countries, okay? These countries are called DAC countries, DAC countries, okay? They are members of OECD. And in time, they develop what you call an aid giving uh, regime, okay? They put some rules about how aid should be given, how it should be calculated. You know, aid is a part of uh, public relations, a part of soft power. So sometimes they pretend to give aid, but it seems that most of the money is for their own companies, okay? Um, so to avoid these kind of applications to give aid, which is useful because most of the aid uh, research is found out to be being wasted, they developed an aid regime among them. And suddenly China, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative, the debt trap policy, and all these countries started to give aid and they disrupt this aid regime. So in a sense, uh, Japan wanted to make cooperation with Turkey for a number of reasons, okay? One of them was to actually develop Turkey as an aid donor, okay? How to give aid, how to give effective aid, and how to uh, keep the integrity of this, okay? And also, uh, this is a part of United Nations uh, policy, uh, is to develop relations in, among Southern countries, South-South cooperation. So the definitions are here, the triangular cooperation is about uh, cooperation, collaboration, in which a traditional donor country like Japan, okay, or a multilateral organization, it could be World Bank or something else, okay, facilitates South-South initiatives, okay. Um, for instance, they are making some training programs in Turkey. Uh, they are organized in Turkey. Some trainees are coming from Japan, some from Turkey, but uh, all the trainees are coming from surrounding countries, from Balkans, you know, imagine the Turkey's geography, Middle East, Balkan countries, Southwest, uh, Southeast Europe, okay, Central Asian countries, Caucasian countries. Turkey has cultural connections with all of these, okay? As a part of, you know, as a legacy of Ottoman Empire, we have some cultural similarities, of course, with the Middle East, but with Balkan countries as well, and also Central Asia as well, okay? And by this way, Turkey is actually increasing its relations with the regional countries, aid relations, but Japan is at the center of this. So that's how they increase South-South cooperation, which is defined as the broad framework of collaboration among countries of the South, okay? So Japan actually has experience with this. Immediately after the Second World War, Japan was receiving aid from Thailand, but it was developed to a certain extent. It started to give aid to so, sorry, Japan was receiving aid from the United States, but it was also giving aid to Thailand, which was much poorer at that time, okay? So this was a part of as a triangular cooperation. At that time, the center was United States, facilitating relations between Thailand and Japan. You know, trade is always related with, sorry, aid is always related with trade as well. We increase the aid between ODA between the two countries, the trade between the two countries increase as well. So this is an effort to tie up the world from a neoliberal standpoint, make countries maybe dependent to each other and trade with each other, okay? 
And that's how they were hoping to bring Armin. So Japan has this experience, okay? And uh, this became a central part of Japanese aid policy as well. JICA, the Japanese major trade giving agency, uh, is actually considers the South-South Corporation and tri Triangular Corporation as very effective because it uh, expands you know, Japanese experience much easier to the rest of the world, okay? It contributes to regional cooperation, okay? And also complements all the other bilateral cooperation by facilitating knowledge and experience between these two countries. Now, there is an acceptance also that uh, because like Indonesia and Turkey both have some development problems, okay, we have some common experiences. And Japan has now already became a developed country or some, I don't know, Scandinavian country. We might help each other more because we share the same troubles, okay? We can share from each other's experience. So South-South cooperation is important in that sense as well. After this presentation, I made some contacts with the Turkish aid giving agency, which is called TICA. And I will ask about what kind of South-South cooperation is there between Indonesia and Turkey as well. This is an ongoing research that I'm doing. And also this became a South-South cooperation and triangle cooperation is one of the sustainable development goals, okay? Uh, sorry for the uh, misspelling here, of United Nations, UNDP, okay? It's in the category seven, the last category, partnership for the goals, okay? So the United Nations want to increase this kind of South-South cooperation and uh, triangular cooperation. How much time do I have? Okay, I should uh, wrap up actually. I would like to give half an hour to questions and answers. So anyway, uh, this is important for, for these reasons, triangular cooperation and South-South cooperation is preferred. One thing maybe I should mention is that it's not really written very much in the official documents, of course, but I feel that this is also an outsourcing of aid. You know, instead of Japan making training, uh, training programs by flying everybody to Japan and give training and flying them back, it's much cheaper to do this in Turkey, okay? taking the local countries, collecting them in Turkey, only the Japanese tra uh, trainers might come to Turkey and teach them, okay? It makes it cheaper, it makes the aid cheaper and more efficient in that sense. And also, yes, they benefit from similar language, cultures, and climates, and um, actually, by its own experience, by its local knowledge, Turkey is able to, you know, direct Japanese uh, aid to where it is necessary and efficient, okay? Yes, I think I covered these uh, slides more and more, uh, more or less, okay. And yes, this creates a new partnerships. So um, now uh, uh, it's good I talked about these, okay. Uh, so it's an effort to prepare Turkey as a future donor, as an emerging economy, okay. And uh, Japan is very committed. Now, if you're going to make any study about Japanese ODA policy, uh, or aid policy, a few documents that you have to check out. Uh, now, the Japanese ODA is done this way. The general policy is defined by Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but the implementation is done by JICA, okay? JICA is under Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So um, they, uh, the documents that you have to follow are the ODA charter, which they did one in 2003, and they did a midterm order plan for 2005. And they were preparing for another one after COVID because the COVID pandemic changed everything. It came out that health, aid on health is very important and infrastructure for that is very important. So when I was in Japan, I was talking about JICA officials about this, interviewing them. And they said they were preparing any ODA, ODA charter, okay? So JICA is the implementing agency, okay? And it identifies triangular cooperation as one of the key prioritized areas. Now, another document you might want to look at is the white paper. Japan also has an official development assistance white paper, which was published in 2012. And I'm sure they're about to bring up uh, anyone if they haven't done already. Uh, another document that you have to look at are these country assistance policies or programs, okay? There is one for Indonesia as well. Now, I checked the one for Turkey here, okay? This is country specific, okay? Not every country is there, okay? Some important countries are there. Of course, Indonesia is there, okay? As a major aid recipient of Japanese ODA. Um, 
And uh, this is to give more transparency to ODA projects, of course. Now, anything about Japan does are actually in the JICA website that you can follow out. And uh, the way they select target countries is about how much you know uh, strategic importance, how much aid they necessitate, uh, their relationship with the global issues, of course, about poverty, diseases, reconstruction, earthquake, etc. They want to have a really regional balance. Priority of Japanese aid is on Asia, okay? But they don't want to give only to Asia, so they are distributing their aid to other continents, other parts as well, okay? Um, now let me go on with these. Yes. Uh, now in these country assistance programs, you can see about the conditions and problems of the country, what kind of development plans are there, how significant is Japanese economic cooperation? What goals they have? What are the priority areas? And some specific points to be considered in implementation, okay? Uh, and uh, if you look at the ODA white paper, okay, you see that there's a concern about these emerging donor countries, China, India, Saudi Arabia, Brazil, Turkey, who do not quite act uh, uh, like the traditional donor countries. And since they are having an influence on the development agenda, they have to make some development cooperations with them, okay? And this uh, actually triangular cooperation, South-South cooperation is even reflected in the G20 discussions as well. Uh, and Japan is an interesting country in that sense because uh, relatively recently, okay, Japan was receiving aid. Okay, recently, which still means half a century, okay? But nevertheless, most of the traditional donor countries have not been receiving aid for a very long time, okay? But Japan as a donor country still carries on some of its experience of working with the developing world. And it has been a part of the South and it was perceived to be a part of the South, at least in, in, immediately after the Second World War. So they have some unique experiences there. Uh, and uh, one thing you have to mention is that uh, this aid policy is very important in Japanese security policy as well, okay? If you look at the language, they talk about internationalism, peaceful nation, proactive pacifism, you know, all these uh, emphasis on Japan as a pacifist country or a peaceful nation, etc. You know, the history problem that the Japan has and its aid is a part of actually overcoming it, okay? And it's also a part of its uh, security policy. Now, this is a long slide. I'm just going to focus on something. They understand the importance of the emerging and developing countries, and they understand the stable growth of the global economy. Oops, sorry. Now, Japan understands that it's wealth, it's richness, okay? It's security, stability, rests on the rest of the world. Japan does not have much of natural resources. It's buys natural resources from abroad, gives some value added to it, and sells it back, okay? So stability of the world is important for the Japanese people's life standard and their security. So they see aid policy as key, okay, uh, to its own um, uh, okay, as a key to its own sustainable prosperity, okay? Uh, Japanese national interests, they understand, these are all official statements from the Development Cooperation Charter, okay? Is inseparable, okay? The, 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 the stable and prosperous international society is inseparable from Japan's own national interests. So they adopt this, what they like to call proactive pacifism, okay? Which is on internationalism, okay? And this is, for the securing of Japanese national interests. So Japanese aid policy is a part of, of Japanese national interest. And uh, if you have followed, um, you know, Japan made a new interpretation of its constitution in 2015. It relaxed the limitations on its military force, okay? And immediately after that, Japan started to engage in military cooperation with Southeast Asian countries, especially. But even there, the military cooperation is under the umbrella of, uh, for instance, earthquake mitigation or disaster mitigation, okay? If there is a tsunami again, 
how could Japanese self-defense forces could go to aid, how it could cooperate with the, say, Indonesian Navy and et cetera. So even the military cooperation, okay, is under this jacket, under this framework of uh, aid, okay, or development cooperation or training programs, okay. So even Japanese military security policy still is going on these aid policy and stuff like this, okay. Now this uh, presentation is going to be handed out to you students. I think you can read the details from here, but I also looked what kind of philosophy they possibly would have, okay, in their aid policy. And some phrases they focus, humanism, again, if you're going to study foreign aid and its impact and stuff like that, the Japanese aid philosophy is different than the Western countries aid philosophy to a certain extent. Generally, the Western countries, European countries, United States, focus on what you call freedom from fear, okay? Which means giving aid uh, to opposition politicians or some uh, civil societies in, in, in developing countries and somehow uh, developing democracy there, okay? This is a problem, actually, because this is perceived as a regime export, okay? And sometimes it increases uh, uh, authoritarianism in those countries. Now, Japanese, I believe, uh, as a relatively late developer, is more realistic about this. They understand that a healthy democracy is very difficult to establish. Indonesia is one of the few examples for this, actually. Uh, before, you know, that country becomes a high-level income country. And first, institutions should be supported. First, people should be fed. Okay? They should have housing and stuff like that. And then institutions like the law courts, you know, the police force, of course, uh, and elections you know, should be done in a free and decent manner. So they gave the aids to these. And they say that first we focus on free uh, from want. Okay? So Western countries focus on free from fear. Japan focus on free from want. Okay? First, materially, people should be supported. And they try to do this through uh, supporting the human resources. Lots of training programs are there. So this is important, I think, an important distinction of Japanese aid, okay? And experience, of course, as I have said, you know, as a first developed Asian country, it went through stages that the Asian countries are passing through relatively recently. As a major country in the world, as an economic superpower, it's understand that it has some international responsibilities, okay? This is also a part of this philosophy. We have to give this aid, they say, because we are responsible. Because we developed early, Japan is a rich country, it has to give aid to the rest of the world. So there's a sense of responsibility as well. And the last one, which I explained in the last slide, actually, this understanding of what they call comprehensive security. Uh, if the neighborhood is in fire, it doesn't matter how rich you are, how big a house you have, your house is going to burn as well, okay? So they understand that their security is pretty much connected with the security of the rest of the world, and especially Asia, and their prosperity depends on the stability of the world. And this actually, in a sense, pushes Japan to be active in giving aid, uh, in a sense, to achieve its own security. Uh, okay, I'm going to wrap up. Uh, it seems I made a bit too many slides, okay. Just going back to Turkey-Japan relations, there is this triangle cooperation. TICA is actually a Turkish aid giving agency, which is modeled after JICA, okay. And they're coordinating together, okay. And they give aid to Central Asian countries, for instance, okay. Some examples like these. And because of the Syrian refugees, this is 2016, uh, Turkey became one of the highest uh, uh, recipient of JICA programs. Most of the aid is given to the regional, uh, to cities where are near to Syrian border, okay? Since Turkey accepted so many Syrian refugees, the cities just beside the Syrian border exploded in the population, okay? Suddenly millions and millions of people came and the infrastructure of those cities became insufficient, okay? The sewage, the drinking water and the stuff like that. And they had to rebuild the infrastructure of those cities. So JICA gave a lot of aid in terms of that, okay. And this is from the uh, Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs and JICA sites. It says that Japan regards Turkey as one of its most important aid recipients in the Middle East. 
and actively provides assistance. And it gives the reasons for that. Turkey is an important region. Uh, it has a harmonious working relations with the West. Well, this is a bit of an old document. The relations with the West is not that harmonious anymore. But rest assured, Turkey is very much embedded in Western uh, institutions, starting with NATO um, and uh, all other European related institutions and the stuff like that. Turkey still needs aid because it's a large population. And also, Turkey is a geopolitically important country because it's at the crossroads of Asia, Middle East, and Europe. Okay, most of these aid is on the damage, disaster damage re uh, reduction. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm going to, I think, yes. Uh, and uh, Japan takes Turkey as an important partner in this triangular and south south cooperation as well. I hope uh, I did not bore you too much with this uh, presentation. This is a part of my ongoing research, okay? Uh, let me stop the share for a while. I have another presentation slide which focuses only on Turkey-Japan relations. But I would rather prefer to, you know, take questions from you related with the presentations or unrelated with the presentations. You might be inter interested in some other stuff about Turkey or Japan or Turkey's relations with Southeast Asia, maybe. So I would like to, you know, since we have half an hour more, uh, I would like to give floor to, to the students to ask some questions uh, if they would like to. Okay, thank you, Professor Bahadur, for the insightful presentation you shared with us, ladies and gentlemen. That's a few of the presentation of today's material. Now we will continue by opening the next session question and answer. But before I let my fellow students with their questions, if you allow me, I would like to review um, your presentation to my friends. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Yes. Uh, hadirin, itulah pemaparan materi uh, dari Profesor Bahadir. Beliau memaparkan filantropi lintas sejarah hubungan kerjasama ekonomi politik di Asia, khususnya dalam konteks Jepang. Beliau menjelaskan hubungan kerjasama politik ekonomi dari perspektif geografis, di mana tidak seperti Indonesia, Turki merupakan negara yang sekali mengalami bencana gempa bumi. Melalui fenomena ini, Jepang dan Turki memiliki kerjasama dalam beberapa bidang. Mereka bertekad untuk membawa kemitraan strategis yang sejalan dengan persahabatan historis mereka yang telah dipaparkan oleh Profesor kita. Seperti negara lain, Republik Turki telah menjalin kerjasama ekonomi melalui perjanjian perdagangan bebas dengan beberapa negara secara bilateral, terlebih lagi antara Turki dengan Jepang, uh, semakin intens sejak dekade terakhir. Turki juga menjalin kerjasama dengan Jepang yang didorong oleh beberapa faktor, yaitu meliputi Kementerian Ekonomi Turki yang berusaha untuk meningkatkan investasi dari Jepang, baik dari segi perdagangan dan hubungan kerjasama bilateral. Hubungan bilateral ini uh, dalam kedua negara ini sangat kuat dan akan terus ditingkatkan pada tahap selanjutnya. All right. So, uh, to the fellow students who want to ask the question, Please raise your hand first. The question will then be answered immediately by Professor Bahadir. All right, Professor, we have our first uh, questioner yes. from Anisha. Um, good afternoon, Professor Bahadir. I'm Anisha Rahmadani from the Sociology and Anthropology Study Program. Excuse me, I want to ask, sir, what is the form of triangle cooperation and southern cooperation? What are the results obtained from this cooperation? Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, now, uh, it seems mostly <clears throat> uh, which are clearly under the banner of triangular cooperation is actually the training programs uh, that uh, uh, 
Japan has been conducted in Turkey in relationship with TICA. Uh, and uh, these have been for the energy efficiency, some of them. There was a training of the Afghan police force in Turkey, for instance, okay. Generally, these kind of programs are there. But uh, as I extend my research, I also found out that uh, Turkey and uh, uh, TICA and uh, JICA, uh, the eight cooperation uh, institutions of uh, both countries, were involved in some other geographies as well, okay? Interestingly, this was not under the title of triangular or south-south cooperation, uh, but it could be actually from the nature of this. Uh, and they, for instance, built some joint hospitals in Central Asia, it seems and they were doing some stuff in Africa as well. The truth is I'm going to get the details. <laughs> I apologize. <coughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's the allergies here. Um, uh, actually, uh, in the following week, I'm going to have a meeting with Tika and going to take a list of, of Japan, Turkey cooperation projects, okay? Because of the COVID pandemic, unfortunately, I couldn't get a hand of it. Um, mostly, it seems actually uh, going through uh, uh, training programs, at least, and some joint uh, uh, aid efforts in some other uh, regions, like building some infrastructure. I see there are other hands raised as well. Thank you, Professor, for the wonderful. By the way, is my English uh, clear to understand? I might be speaking too fast, maybe. Yes, it's, it's very clear, Professor. You know, we, we all have our accents, you see. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next question will be given to Ulumul Huda. Ulumul Huda, the chance is yours. All right. Thank you, Shakira, for the opportunities for me. Um, hello to Professor, sir. Uh, my name is Ulumul Huda and I'm from Sociology and Anthropology programs in University UNES Semarang. So, all right. Uh, thank you for, uh, for the interested materials today that you have been presented for us. And I really amazing with your point of view. So I have uh, two questions for you. So the equations are, if we talk about the economic and political relations Turkey between other countries in Asia, so how about your opinion about young generations to learn a lot uh, about, his, about this history? And one of my question is, what do you think about that history is always continue? Did you agree with that? Can you please give me the reasons why you agree with that? Thank you. Thank you, Ulumul, for your question. Can you repeat the first question again? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Uh, so the first question for me is uh, if we talk about the economic and political relations uh, about Turkey between the other countries in Asia, so how about your opinion about the young generation we are as a millennial to learn a lot about this history? Uh, the, the young people about learning about history, you said, right? Yes, of course, because, yes. uh, yeah, because we are as a millennial, maybe we don't like to learn about that history because maybe really difficult or anything else. I see. Well, some students like history, some don't, but uh, it's important, actually. Uh, I mean, uh, sadly so, uh, the Turkey's uh, historical relations with Asia, especially Indonesia, is studied uh, very little, uh, which bothers me, actually. Uh, actually, Turkey and Indonesian relations are quite old, with, you know, the Ottomans sending the ships to Aceh, you know, to fight against the Portuguese. And then uh, they try to do it again. <laughs> but uh, this history is known very little, actually, uh, also in Turkey. Only recently, I hear uh, scholars started to research this and study it in Turkey. But what is important is that how history is used to construct the modern world, OK? The history is there. 
but you can use history to recreate something today, okay? So that's why actually studying history is important. Now, uh, many people in Turkey, I'm a bit ashamed to say that, would know very little about Indonesia, probably have never been to Indonesia, and they don't really have chances to meet Indonesian people that much in Turkey, even though uh, uh, there's an old history there. And uh, I imagine Indonesia to be somewhat similar to Malaysia, <laughs> And I see how friendly people were there. I had Indonesian friends in Japan when I was studying there, okay? And uh, actually history can be used in a sense to, you know, increase the curiosity of students for another country. Uh, when I give the Asia Pacific class in the university, I talk about the Ottoman ships that went to Indonesia, whom ne they never came back by the way, they stayed in Aceh, okay? And we don't know what happened to them, okay? But the Ottomans were co feeling connected with the Indonesians at that time, and they tried to, to help, okay, as much as they could. So when I talk about this to Turkish students, suddenly in their minds, Indonesia, uh, let me say, comes into the radars, okay? After I talk about this, they recognize Indonesia more in the news. They look at the internet, they start reading about it. And some of them are quite interested as well. And I hope some of them will go and study in Indonesia. Uh, we do not have any experts about on, on, on Indonesia, as far as I know. A few Turkish students have been there, uh, but more has to be done, okay? So this way, I think history is important, I believe. Uh, so, you know, increase the curiosity uh, for, to the, for the, among the young people. And the second question you asked was, uh, what was it? So the second question is uh, about the statement that history is always continue. So my question is about, do you agree with that statement? And if I, you agree or that, that agree, uh, can you give me the reasons why about that yes, statement? I think I, I think I have just actually uh, given it, is that history is used by historians to construct something new, okay? Turkish-Japanese relations, okay, today, the modern Turkish-Japanese relations is constructed by this historical narrative, okay? So we make history continue by using the stories in the history to, you know, create something new today, to create new identities today. So it is continuing, I think, because we make it so. Of course, you could create a history of animosity and, you know, anger and revenge as well. It could be bad as well, you know? And th that's how many people do actually nowadays. The, yes, okay. Um, we, who, who would like to ask the second, uh, the other, the second question? Uh, okay, thank you, Professor. That is very insightful. I am very amused. The next opportunity will be given to Fairus Kwamila. To Fairus Kwamila, the chance is yours. Uh, first of all, I want to apologize for not being able to open my camera because uh, of my condition. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Master of Ceremony, Ms. Shakira. Uh, hello, Dr. Bahadir. I hope you're in a good condition. I'm Fairos from Sociology and Anthropology. I would like to ask about the factors that encourage cooperation between Turkey and Japan in threat sector. Thank you. Uh, can you tell me again? The, the voice was a bit uh, disturbed. Uh... I couldn't get the question very well. The relations between Turkey and Japan specifically? Let me, let me help to make it clear, Professor. I think she is curious about the factors that encourage cooperation between Turkey and Japan in the trade sector. Thank you. In trade sector? Yes. I see. Well, the uh, I don't know the details, okay. Uh, Generally, aid is a part of trade, as I said, okay? And the Japanese officials very clearly told me that um, uh, they wanted to actually create cooperation between Turkish and Japanese businesses, and they are using aid for that purpose. I'm still yet to find a clear example of this, okay? But if your question is about generally trade relations, uh, there are lots of Japanese investments in Turkey, but uh, actually among the Asian countries, uh, Turkey trades most with China and then South Korea and Japan comes after that, okay? 
so uh, the trade relations between Turkey and Japan uh, could be stronger, let me say, but it is getting stronger in general. I don't know if I could answer your question by this, but. Thank you, Professor. Uh, okay. Our next uh, questioner will uh, will be given to Muhammad Haikal, if I'm not mistaken. To Muhammad Haikal, the chance is yours. Uh, okay, thank you, Ms. Shahira. Uh, first, I want to say thank you and good afternoon. Previously, sorry I couldn't turn on the camera because my laptop wa camera was low. And hello, Professor Bahadir Tahifan Turk. Here I want to ask a question. Uh, what do you think are the multilateral cooperation activities to enhance our peace in Indonesia with the Turkish Republic, with which we share common language, culture, religion, and history and values? Maybe that's it, Prof. Thanks, Kate Bench. Thank you very much. You asked about the Turkey's relations with Indonesia, right? Um, uh, yes, actually, uh, there is a growing interest in Indonesia and Turkey, and generally in Southeast Asia as well. Uh, Turkey has become uh, ASEAN's uh, sectoral dialogue partner in the year um, uh, 2017, okay? Uh, and um, um, as a part of this, uh, Turkey offered many uh, projects. Uh, they said it's, they, it promised to fund about two, 20 billion dollars of projects all over ASEAN, okay? And one of the conditions is that it should be all over ASEAN countries. Now, the truth is, Turkish government is very much uh, interested in Muslim-majority countries, okay? Malaysia, Indonesia, they have some interest in Southern Philippines, okay? Uh, but ASEAN wants, of course, the projects for the all ASEAN, you know, to, to strengthen the ASEAN centrality, you know, and integration of ASEAN. So, um, uh, in order to develop relations, a Turkish ambassador in Jakarta was also accredited as the ASEAN ambassador. And as far as I know, they are planning to establish a second assembly, uh, 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 embassy, in Jakarta, one for Indonesia, one for ASEAN as well, okay? So it started with the diplomatic relations. Turkey is stepping up its relations with Southeast Asia and Indonesia as well. Now, I am still, as I said, I apologize, but I'm still trying to get from TICA, from the Turkish aid agency, its activities in Indonesia and the rest of ASEAN, okay? I haven't received that information yet. But I've heard that they are funding various infrastructure and training programs all around ASEAN and Indonesia as well, but I don't know the geographical localities of this yet. Um, they are providing development assistance through various projects, okay? And uh, uh, at least even before the sectoral dialogue partnership was established, they provided something like 150 million US dollars to all ASEAN countries, okay? Uh, but most of these were going to Muslim majority countries. Uh, so, um, now the goal is actually to increase the diplomatic relations first, uh, and then through these aid relations, develop trade relations as well. Uh, the Indonesia-Turkey trade is not very big volume as far as I know, there is some, uh, but through these efforts, it might increase as well. There are some scholarship given to Indonesian students also to give in Turkey, but I don't know the numbers of this, how many students are taken. But I do meet sometimes students from Southeast Asia. I met a lot of students from Cambodia for some reason who were studying in Turkey with the Turkish government scholarships. There are English language universities in Turkey that you might be interested to make graduate study. If you are interested in this region in Turkey, uh, you might be, I, I will be happy that, to have you in Ankara <laughs> if it's possible. Uh, one thing that I'd like to add is that uh, in the last five or six years, the Turkish economy is not going very well, okay? So it's kind of this aid activity slowed down a little bit. I don't have the numbers yet. But uh, this COVID pandemic started and they started sending lots of uh, aid 
to other countries as well. I had some numbers for Indonesia, but I'm, I have to find my PowerPoints for that as well. Um, do you have any other uh, questions? Um, I think there isn't any question left, Professor. Would you like to continue your presentation or are we go coming to an end? Well, it's up to you. Uh, I think, uh, I, unfortunately, I cannot give you hard facts about Turkey-Indonesia relations, but I will try to wrap it up next time, <laughs> if possible. Uh, and uh, I try to give a general overview of Turkey's relations, aid relations with Japan and Japanese aid uh, policy, if you want to follow up on that. I did not talk very much about Turkey's relations with China or South Korea. Turkey was a participant of the Korean War, and it's actually the third country with the biggest losses in the Korean War. So Turkish-South Korea relations are quite special. And uh, Turkey-China relations, well, um, um, it has its ups and downs, let me say, okay? Depending on the Uyghur problem, the East Turkestan, we call it, Xinjiang region, Turkish-Chinese relations are sometimes good, sometimes bad. Uh, these are just the overall that I can give. And uh, I would like to add also, Turkey is also giving lots of aid to Arakan uh, Muslims in Myanmar as well, okay? It's one of the very active aid donors in, in Myanmar. Um, just a side note. But that's about it. If you don't have any other questions, I think uh, you could wrap it up. Well, um, it's good to know that for your information, we still have about a maximum of 18 minutes. If you have any last words, it would be really great for us. Uh, thank you very much for this honor that you give me to talk to Indonesian students. It's the first time I'm giving class to in, in, in Indonesia, okay? Speak to the Indonesian students. You can share my email if you'd like, and uh, if the students are interested in anything about this presentation or about in general in Turkey or Japan for that matter, uh, I will be very happy. And I'm really, really happy to be here and talking to you. Thank you very much. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end for today's course. I would like to say thank you to Professor Bahadir Hedivantik and all the attendees who have cooperated in the process of this class. Before I finish, I apologize profusely for my mistakes and shortcomings as Master of Ceremony. It's been a pleasure being with you, Professor, and all of my fellow students. I wish you all a very good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you.